and welcome to today's Tidings. I'm your host, Joyce Tumia. Today we're going to talk about domestic violence, but we're going to focus on a slightly different slant. We're not going to talk primarily about the victims, nor the victimizers. We're going to talk about raising <laughs> awareness with the male population in particular as a preventive measure. And my guest is Greg Bussey. And Greg, what would you like to share about your background? I'd like to let my guests share some background information on themselves before we dig into the topic here. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate I'm that. Thrilled to have um, you. Thanks. Um, probably that's, I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, about 13 years ago, I got a bachelor's degree in computer science uh, mm -hmm. from the Rose Holman Institute of Technology, which is a small but prestigious engineering school in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, and I was a software engineer, software developer, worked in computers for mm -hmm. in programming for about 13 years. Uh, and then a couple years ago, um, I decided that I wanted to start giving back to my community because uh, my wife and I are in a very good financial position. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, you know, I went through some changes in life and I was reading books and interacting with different people who kind of turned me on to the idea of giving back to, you know, co my community. Um, so I did some research and it was either going to be um, working with domestic violence or it was going to be uh, in an animal shelter. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't have the heart to work with animals. It's just, uh, you know, with a human being, you can ask them what hurts and mm -hmm. you can, you know, fix the problem with animals. I just, uh, I, don't, I don't have the heart to watch animals suffer. So, um, and then, you know, uh, through my research, I realized that domestic violence is one of the biggest problems in our society. And I thought that that's, you know, maybe where I could help. I so I started volunteering a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and um, as a result of that, I actually uh, lost my well, last my, lost my job in this past June. And instead of going back into software, I decided to um, go back to school, and I'm going to be uh, working on a master's uh, working on a master's program in social work. Wonderful! Wow, that's very impressive. That <laughs> is quite a career switch there too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, but I, you know, going back a little bit, I see your point about with the animals because mm -hmm. they're helpless, they're dependent on mm -hmm. us, and human beings might ne obviously need help, but mm -hmm. they are able to do some things for themselves once mm -hmm. they learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. And I always think that how can we have world peace if we don't have peace starting right within the home? Oh, you know, absolutely that we have agree. To start there. How can we have world peace if we can't even have it there? Mm -hmm. Let's be a little bit basic here and define domestic violence because there are certain ideas people have, you mm -hmm. know, that it's just physical. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it bears repeating that it is not just physical. It can mm -hmm. be verbal, it can be physical intimidation without mm -hmm. ever touching a person, you know, mm -hmm. just like having someone stand against the wall and the arms on the side mm -hmm. or, you know, some other things like that. We're not going to go into a lot of gory detail. We're not going mm -hmm. to go into any gory detail. <laughs> I think people know, you know, but I want to stress the fact that it's not just physical and then it's also not just um, men doing it to women. I'll let you talk. <laughs> well, uh, domestic violence is a, a more general term for it would be domestic abuse because okay. the violence, domestic violence is um, a more narrow definition of the actual physical hitting and the, um, you know, all the physical stuff and, and um, you know, throwing things. And, um, but domestic abuse, um, abusers never start out in their, uh, in their relationships with the hitting. It always starts with verbal and emotional abuse first. Really? Because if um, you know, if you go out on a third date with somebody and they punch you in the face, there's not a connection yet, yeah. and they the the victim is more likely to just sever ties completely. Um, whereas mm -hmm. if it starts out as um, usually the, the first things that abusers tend to say to their victims is, um, you know, you you know, you're putting on a little weight. I'd like you to start losing some weight, or maybe. Um, you know, you're spending a little too much time with your friends, and they're putting some bad ideas in your head. I, I maybe you don't. I don't want you talking to this person anymore. And so then control it, issues yeah, start they, to they, appear. Y yes, the domestic violence okay. is based upon the concepts of power and control. That okay. is the. Those are the two words that they sh that they keep repeating to us in uh, you know in this field. Okay. Um, the idea is that the abuser wants the victim. To, uh, the abuser wants to be the center of the victim's universe. Mm -hmm. um, they want the victim to pay attention and do everything for the abuser and nobody else. And as a result, um, the verbal and emotional abuse gets worse and worse and worse, usually. Um, and then, you know, and, and there, are some, uh, there are some instances, there's plenty of abusive relationships that don't actually involve physical hitting mm -hmm. or, or the, uh, the actual physical violence might only be once a year or something. It might, there might be only like one big blow up but um, the whole idea of isolating 
someone from their friends, their families, mm -hmm. their communities. Um, the oftentimes abusers uh, pressure their victims to quit their jobs and stay at home. Um, you know, there's, it, it, and it gets, it can get really, really bad. Like there are, uh, there are abusers who um, when they will make a grocery list mm -hmm. for the victim and they'll send them out and they'll give them just enough money to pay for the for the whatever's the on the grocery on the list, list. Hmm. and then they'll demand to have the change back and they'll actually count out the change and if there's even a penny missing you know there's consequences mm -hmm. so they don't want the victims mm -hmm. to have any control over their own lives at all they want to just have everything centered around them mm -hmm. so it's not just physical violence it is there are plenty of abusive relationships that are st strictly based around verbal and emotional and um, I, I don't want to get into too many gory details here, but mm -hmm. this is a very important point that I want to point out is that oftentimes the first incidence of physical violence within an abusive relationship is um, when the woman gets pregnant. Mm -hmm. And that is because, and the reason for that is because the abuser knows that um, once that baby is born, the abuser is no longer going to be the center of the victim's universe. Mm -hmm. It's going to be that baby. And so he's not going to be, well, I say he because it's primarily you know, we're right. still, uh, yeah, right. it's still primarily men that are abusers, right. but they know that, and they, they, that's uh, that that other ch that child is is a threat, and that's um, one of the reasons why domestic violence continues to be what we call the cycle of violence. Because when that ch child gets neglected, that child is more likely to get neglected or abused too, because it's a the abuser sees the child as a threat, so they make the victim take care of, you know, do all the caretaking or whatever and don't get involved. Um, and then if the child inevitably sees or hears the abuse going on, they start to th maybe think that's normal behavior and they carry it on through their life. Okay, so. and because things aren't black and, white, black and white, we can't automatically assume that in every case of domestic abuse, d domestic violence, that if there are children, it's because the couple doesn't know anything about birth control, mm -hmm. you know, um, there might be conflicted motives. Maybe the husband thought he would like children or wants children because it's a traditional thing to do and everybody has children, mm -hmm. but at the same time still resents the child. Is yeah. that, would that be safe to say? Yeah. Because otherwise the first thought that went through my head was, well, then why do they ever get their wives pregnant? Well, but, I mean, there's, there's, yeah. yeah, there's not every pregnancy is wanted. Right. And then there but are. they're not all unwanted either. Right. There, and then some of the plan. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, there might be the conflicting motives. Yes, exactly. Okay. They'll have a, there will be a planned pregnancy, okay. um, but then there might be, you know, regrets. Oh, well, you know, I wanted to have a kid because that sounded like the right thing to do, but now wait a second. Now that kid is going to be the center of her universe, and I'm not going to get all the attention now. And so that's, you know, that, that can be a problem. And it's also very important that, that something that you touched on is that we also have to understand that the, um, and, and this isn't the case with all abusers, but... Mm -hmm adult male abusers who are abusing their victims right now mm -hmm. were likely abuses kids too. So we have that, um, it's, it's important to keep in mind that while we feel bad for abused children and we want to protect them and help them, mm -hmm. we also have to understand that when they grow up and they haven't gotten the help that they need mm -hmm. and their therapy that they need, they'll become abusers too. And then when they become adults and they're abusers, we say, oh, throw them in prison or do this and do that. And then we have this very vengeful tendency for them. Well, what they are is they're, they're sick and they need help because they never got the help that they needed when they were younger in life. So I don't want to defend abusers. I certainly you know the, the behavior is deplorable and, and needs to be addressed. But at the same time, if we, are, uh, if we take a very vengeful, uh, petty and vengeful um, attitude towards th that sort of problem instead of a more of a therapeutic one mm -hmm. um, it, the pro it'll, it won't fix the problem and if anything it'll make it worse you know th there are men who uh, actually do get or the abusers who get the police called on them get sent mm -hmm. to jail and then the first thing they do is when they come out is they go back and they abuse their partners even more severely it's because we don't address the problem mm -hmm. we incarcerate them and we punish them but we mm -hmm. don't fix the problem and the problem is that they need to understand what they're doing and that, that it's, it's not it's not right. And uh, oftentimes they don't uh, understand what they're doing is, I mean, they know what they're doing is wrong, but at the same time they don't, they don't think of it as entirely abnormal. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's in some cases not all of them. So it, it's, uh, I just wanted to address the point that there's the, the abuse kids often tend to grow up into adults. Do we have statistics on that? I mean, do we know what percentage it is? Because I remember hearing statistics about things mm -hmm. like, you know, what percentage of children in a family would grow up and smoke 
depending on how many mm -hmm. parents smoked. I don't remember mm -hmm. what they were, but I know it wasn't like half, mm -hmm. or it might have been it might have been half. You know that if a, if one parent smokes, half the children might be likely to smoke. Mm -hmm. Back when more yeah. people smoked to begin mm -hmm. with, but it wasn't like automatically if you had parents who smoked, all the children would smoke. Mm -hmm. So do we know what percentage? I mean, I don't half, have any statistics. Less than half? Okay. Yeah, I mean, but it's bad that it's at all. Yeah, and yeah, uh, okay. the whole idea is that it is. That's why we call it the cycle of violence or the mm -hmm. cycle of abuse, is because it is a cycle, and it and it's and it's cyclical in more than one way. Um, the cycle of abuse in, within a relationship, usually what we call the honeymoon phase, mm -hmm. and that's where everything's nice, and there's gifts, and there's dates, and there's kisses, mm -hmm. and the sweetness, and then there's a tension building phase where something happens in the abuser's head that they're not quite happy, and they just feel that need to be controlling or whatever, there's, and it's different for every abuser, and then eventually that builds up, and we have the blow up stage, and that's when usually the things happen, there's you know the, the verbal abuse, mm -hmm. emotional abuse, maybe th uh, throwing things, or intimidation, or mm -hmm. you know even physical violence, and then once that tension is released through that act or acts or whatever, then we go back to the honeymoon phase again because then they'll apologize. Oh, it'll never happen again. I'm so sorry. They'll buy flowers. They'll buy candy. Let's go. Mm -hmm. I'll take you out to dinner. I'll do these other things to apologize for it. And then we go back to the honeymoon phase. And so that's the cycle of violence within the relationship. But then there's the cycle, the, the larger cycle that I was just talking about mm -hmm. where, um, you know, these behaviors are, are you, know, with, you know, kids mm -hmm. do what their parents do. And I mean, not all the time. Obviously, if there's kids see their, uh, you know, dad hitting mom or whatever, they they don't think that's right, and they know that's bad. Mm -hmm. But um, especially with the younger men, you know, the young women see it as is uh, often see it worse than the young boys do because they, you know, the father's supposed to be the role model, and if dad's right. hitting mom, and then you see all the bullies at school doing this and doing that, and you see the way other kids interact, mm -hmm. it's kind of reinforced. So um, there's that cycle, that cycle through the generations of mm -hmm. the young men learning from their uh, abusive fathers, uh, mothers, boyfriends, uncles, uh, other family mm -hmm. members, or even friends. You know, uh, uh, people who often live in poor or working class communities. Um, you know, because that's I'm sorry, but you know, socioeconomic class does have somewhat of an effect on violence because there's more stress involved in their daily lives, and that's one of the ways that unfortunately people take it out as on their their uh, um, mm -hmm. partners and then so if uh, a kid from a poor and working class uh, household is comes from an abusive household mm -hmm. they might have other friends in the same community and they'll go over to their houses and see those parents fighting mm -hmm. and they'll and think they'll that that's just it normal the norm. right and then they'll grow up I'm sorry I'll, oh, no, and then ahead. when they grow up they say well they don't you know, the only time they see normal healthy relationships is in the movies and they know that that's kind of fake so yeah, I mean, it just, it's, it, it's another cycle. It perpetuates through generations, and that's mm -hmm. one of the things that I want to do is to help stop that by showing mm -hmm. young men that, hey, that's not normal, that's not right, and we shouldn't be doing that. So. And before we get back to the men, which mm -hmm. is the focus here today, um, it is interesting that you're bringing that up because if that's true for the men following role models, even though they're inappropriate role models, mm -hmm. but being so used to it that they accept it as something normal, then it must also be true for the women who, you know, young girls living in a household like that, and even though at the time, of course, it seems horrible, there's a part of them that might grow to accept the fact that, hey, this is normal, it's, it's unfortunate, but it happens. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the women who accept the abuse. Mm -hmm. May, I don't know what the statistics are for that either, but I'd be interested in looking them up. There must be some statistics about how many women who are in abusive relationships were children with parents who had situations <laughs> like that. It's, I don't know. And yet it had to start somewhere and it has to stop somewhere. So educating everyone is good. But mm -hmm. something you brought up earlier when we were chatting before the show was that traditionally men have viewed this as a woman's problem, a woman's issue. I mean, men who aren't involved in it, who mm -hmm. aren't children of victims or who aren't you know, themselves victimizers. Mm -hmm. Men, if they don't have a sister, for instance, or a daughter, you know, just view this as, well, it, it's a woman's problem. It's not a societal problem. Mm -hmm. So we do need to raise more awareness, perhaps, among the males at this point. Absolutely. Okay. Um, that's, it's, I mean, that's kind of uh, when I first joined Family Shelter Service as a volunteer, uh, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know how I would be welcomed. I knew that I wanted to help, but I didn't know what the role of men was in this field. Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate that Family Shelter Service welcomed me in with uh, open arms, and everything has been very warm and welcoming. Um, they're really positive and really uh, reinforcing of what I'm doing there. Um, but right away, the first thing they said is that your your primary the or 
the, the, way, the way in which you can do the most good mm -hmm. is to be a positive male role model. And not just for, um, well, basically for everyone involved, not just the, uh, the victims that are, who are, who are in the shelter, who are women, to show that, mm -hmm. you know, that an example that not all uh, men are abusive, mm -hmm. and not just for the children, but also for the um, younger uh, male children to see that, you know, hey, you know, there's, there's you know, what would they like to say well-grounded men mm -hmm. who uh, don't abuse people who are in healthy relationships. And I've been you know, happily married to a wonderful woman for nine years. Mm -hmm. and we have a fantastic relationship that just, you know, tends to, it just keeps getting better and better. And mm -hmm. I, have to, I have to say, I have to thank Family Shelter Service for teaching me some of the things that actually made my marriage even better than it already was. Mm -hmm. um, but then, um, yeah, I mean, it's important to, uh, it's important to go out and do what we call prevention, mm -hmm. and so it's not just for the victims and the children in the in the that are in the shelter. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, one of the things that I do is I do I work with our prevention department, mm -hmm. and um, I go out with uh, this woman named Jamie Edwards, and she's my uh, senpai. It's a Japanese term. There's a mm -hmm. senpai, and I'm her kohai, okay. and this just means like senior and junior. And um, okay. so what she is, she is a facilitator. She's an educator, mm -hmm. and she goes. Uh, we go out to uh, church youth groups. Um, we've done work with foster children, and we uh, do work at schools. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's sometimes it's all male, sometimes it's mixed gender, um, sometimes it's small groups, sometimes it's bigger groups. And we go out and we try to target um, kids who are just before puberty or just starting puberty, basically when they're mm -hmm. getting ready to start dating. Mm -hmm. um, and what we do is we show them an example of, okay, here's what a healthy relationship looks like and here's what an abusive relationship looks like. So the so two of you do some role playing? We don't do the role playing ourselves okay. because for me being a rather tall person and Jamie actually being kind of small, uh -huh. it would be, um, mm -hmm. especially if there are any children in the group who, are, who do come from abusive Mm -hmm. uh, relationships, especially the foster kids who tend mm -hmm. to have it rough, that can be a trigger. Ah, so what we okay. usually try to do is that we have the, uh, we make little scripts and note cards mm -hmm. and things and we have the, the students themselves actually do some of the role playing. Okay. Well, and it makes it a lot more fun because right. they're participating in it and they're usually mm -hmm. laughing because they don't know what to do and mm -hmm. they, they end up getting the gist of it but then, because mm -hmm. the thing is with, with me and Jamie, if we were going to try to do it right, it would be pretty realistic and we, because mm -hmm. we, just because based on our background, our knowledge of what happens. Mm -hmm. um, um, so that would be that could potentially be traumatic, and we don't want to scare yeah. kids. We want to educate them. Right. Um, right. So the idea is to show them: here's a healthy relationship, mm -hmm. here's an abusive relationship, and here are the signs and symptoms, and here's some of the things you can do about it. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, one of the kids, one of the young girls uh, in one of the church church youth groups that we worked with, actually said that you know she had she thought that she had been in, in an abusive relationship, and mm -hmm. now she because of our program she knew what that was and was able to identify it and then was able to like do something about it and cut, th cut things off. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a great step forward. And probably the thing for me that's even more important is that she's going to have the tools mm -hmm. to go out and if she sees, you know, because she's going to be going through high school, because she was in junior high at the time, she's going to be going through high school and potentially college and then out into the rest of the world. And she's mm -hmm. going to have more friends. And she's going to have uh, people that are in relationships. And maybe she'll be able to identify an abusive relationship mm -hmm. in one of her friends or mm -hmm. family members. And then she'll be able to help that person potentially avoid a disastrous, isolating, uh, abusive relationship in the future. So okay. that's kind of the thing that makes me... Uh, that makes me really happy is the kind of seeing that setting, uh, you know, making a ripple, mm -hmm. sending a wave out um, to, to spread that information because that's how we have to solve this problem is we have to raise awareness, we have to educate people, um, and we have to give them the tools mm -hmm. to f help fix their problems. And, and you've been doing this very well because you just got a volunteer award at a family <laughs> shelter service event, so congratulations on that. Thank you. This volunteer recognition. And this is also part of a particular group that Family Shelter Service started a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. which is, as you mentioned, perhaps not as active as it could be at the moment, <laughs> but it is still in existence, apparently. Mm -hmm. And this is a group of men mm -hmm. doing just that. So is there anything you, know, you want to address concerning that? I mean, do you know if this was the first of its kind in the country, if it was modeled after other groups already in existence, um, even though it isn't as active as it could be right mm -hmm. now? There are probably lots of ideas for ways in which it could become more active down the road, recruiting other people. Mm -hmm. 
educating other people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the men's group it was a. It certainly wasn't the first one in the country, okay. but it is a very good idea. Mm -hmm. um, they we've tried to do some active recruiting before, and there was only a handful of us. Mm -hmm. um, but there really wasn't a whole lot of things to actually do. So what our uh, uh, coordinator Peggy, mm -hmm. uh, Peggy Radke, who's also the uh, instructor, the primary instructor for the 48-hour. Mm -hmm. uh, class that uh, is so very vital. If I was if I was supreme dictator for life of the planet, I would make sure that that DV course was in every public school, mm. and it really should be a part of every curriculum to teach kids that just you know the mm -hmm. basics of. So it should be a social studies or a, uh, even a, a health in health class mm -hmm. talking about abusive relationships because you know psychological health is uh, very societal important. health very important. Right. Um, but the men's group is the reason I'm here because mm -hmm. Peggy keeps an eye out for opportunities for men to talk about domestic violence in public forums mm -hmm. or in private even private forums. Mm -hmm. So if there's ever opportunities, she sends out emails and says, "Hey, you know, do you, are you available for this? We're going to try to do this." And I was available to do this. So he, this is one of the things that is a result of the men's group. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, we're just trying to keep an eye out for opportunities for men to talk to, you know, other men or other women or whatever it is mm -hmm. to help spread the word about um, domestic violence and to show that men are involved and men should get involved mm -hmm. because this isn't just a woman's problem. It's, mm -hmm. you know, the Jackson Katz was the guy who came up with the idea of uh, these men's groups, you know, he says it's not a women's problem, it's a men's problem. And mm -hmm. he's right because the problem isn't with women, it's just the women who unfortunately feel the negative effects of the problem with men because currently, you know, uh, most abusers are male and most of their victims are female. Mm -hmm. um, and but so, the yeah. Victims it, do play some role. I'm not saying that they're. How do I put it? I'm not saying that they're at fault. They're mm -hmm. just also uneducated, and the role, mm -hmm. and so they also need the awareness because mm -hmm. it quite often takes like seven attempts before they leave for good, and because they, without their being educated, they mistake the control for love. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, you know, not saying they're guilty. I'm just mm -hmm. saying that there is a role where they need to be educated too, obviously. Yes, obviously. Well, as the young girl in your in your program, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I mean. Um, that's one of the things that keeps, well, that, that's one of the primary facets of abuse is that the abuser isolates mm -hmm. the victim. And if you're isolated, you can't get information. You right. can't interact with other people. You're cut off from your family, your friends. You know, you don't mm -hmm. have, often the victims don't have jobs. They're just, they're, they are forced to be subservient to their abuser completely. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard. Um, so one of the things that, w that we do that's been very effective in our program is what we call the bathroom project. Ah. And what we do is we go to um, local businesses and uh, um, gyms mm -hmm. and other places where um, women or their, uh, couples will go, mm -hmm. go out or whatever, and we have these um, signs that we put on the, the back of the ba uh, women's bathroom door mm -hmm. on the way out or in, sometimes inside the stalls. Mm -hmm. um, because oftentimes in the, the public bathroom is one of the few times where a victim is, can be alone by herself and away from her abuser. Mm -hmm. So we have these little uh, discreet um, no, uh, uh, business cards that mm -hmm. they can take and hide in their purse or whatever. They can put the number in their cell phone or whatever mm -hmm. so that they have the hotline number that they can call. And so maybe when the abusers at work or whatever, they can call for advice because mm -hmm. I get a lot of the calls I do. Uh, I have a, a regular sh a hotline shift that I do on Sundays. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, I get more calls from women just asking for relationship advice than I really? do women asking for calling for shelter. Um, mm. And that's it's really important because mm -hmm. they'll ask me like you know this happened and this happened and this happened that's not normal right that's not how it's supposed to be that's not right mm. and you now and I'll explain to them no that's not right he shouldn't mm -hmm. be doing that he's trying to control you he's trying to exert mm -hmm. power over you he's trying to isolate you he's trying to do this mm -hmm. and like you said sometimes it takes multiple calls multiple tries mm -hmm. to leave but at least they have that number that they can get when the abuser can't do anything about it mm -hmm. where they can reach out. And I've gotten plenty of calls from people who have um, uh, a friend or a family member mm -hmm. knows about the abusive relationship and will take the card and will give that to their, uh, you know, the person who they know who's being abused. Mm -hmm. So it's a really wonderful thing and we've, mm -hmm. we've seen a significant increase in the number of hotline calls since that program started. Mm -hmm. So, and, and so that's a good thing and a bad thing, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, right. the abuse is still out there and we're finding out more about it, but it's good that we're giving more people access to our resources. Mm -hmm. So I, f I find that to be just fantastic because that's the first step, is, right. if, is that the abusers don't know or the victims don't know how to leave, they right. don't know what to do because they're so isolated and, mm -hmm. they're, and they're cut off from everything mm -hmm. that 
that's the first step. Give them a tool, give them information, and then it's just sort of a, and you know, unfortunately you can't save them in one phone call. Right. It is, it is a process, it snowballs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they snowball faster than others, mm -hmm. but that's where we get things started. So what would be perhaps the most effective and pervasive, and this is probably a difficult question, but way to get across to men that it's not a good thing to do? I mean, it seems like we ought to get, you know, some really well-known actors or some really well-known actresses or people who are out in the eye of the media mm -hmm. who would just keep constantly hammering home that message. I don't know. Uh, probably so if you can start with the young boys, some have perhaps come from families with abuse and some, you know, I don't think every case is a situation like that. So there must be some where it starts with them because of their own control issues, whether they've seen it growing up or not. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But um, whatever very quick comments you have before we run out of time, because I think, I don't know, it, it, a phone call isn't enough. Um, it's well, got to be chipping away, I guess. For for men to affect other men, the best thing you can do, and this is, and it's very difficult to do this because I've actually had to do this one or two times, and it's you know if you're out with your friends or whatever, and you see one of your friends or family members or whatever say or do something abusive to their partner, hmm. you have to call them out on it. You see, okay. and there's this, and there's this, and we were talking about this earlier about right. there's this uh, in American society personal relationships are private you don't interfere and as soon as you say something to them the first thing they always say is, is it's none of your business you know leave us alone we'll handle mm -hmm. this or whatever but it's really important that those kinds of abusive acts get called out even mm -hmm. if you don't even if you just mention it like mm -hmm. something happens you need to go hey man that's not cool mm -hmm. and then they'll say hey back off at least mm -hmm. you said something you know because th that's all you need is you just need to put that there that hey what you just did wasn't cool mm -hmm. and we're in public and we, I don't approve of that mm -hmm. and that's usually enough because then they get the message, it's like, oh, okay. And it's not going to fix the problem, but at least it kind of points out, and if there's other people with you, mm -hmm. that hey, at least one person in the group was brave enough to speak up, and then maybe right. next time, maybe I'm not there, and another friend's there, and that happens again, maybe that another friend will go, that's not cool. I'm very glad you brought that up, because being a silent witness and not doing anything is part of the problem. Well, mm -hmm. I don't want to say it's part of the problem. It's not part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. And we need solutions. Mm -hmm. So anyone, anywhere, anytime who can do anything, even if it is just a word to someone, to mm -hmm. know that this is not accepted mm -hmm. can go a long way. Mm -hmm. And then for, um, for victims, you know, if, uh, if men know victims, the best thing you can do is if you have a chance to talk to them for alone for five or ten seconds and it's not a, you know, you know it's hard because you have to have social skills to even get that to this point. Uh -huh. Just let them know that you're available to talk. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's all you got to say is, look, if you ever need to call me, if you ever need to talk, that's fine. And they may not actually give you a call, but at least they know that somebody out there cares and is going to be there for them. And maybe eventually down the road things will get so bad they'll actually, you know, give somebody a call and reach mm -hmm. out. And mm -hmm. then it's, you know, men just have to kind of learn, um, you know, and just educate themselves as best they can on, you know, what domestic violence is and what rape is and how, um, you know, and just kind of pay attention to our culture to see how these sorts of things are perpetuated through our, and I'm not going to blame the media for everything, right. but it is partially responsible the way men, women are portrayed, the way men are portrayed in advertising, mm -hmm. movies, TVs, and all that sort of thing. And we have to question that. It's mm -hmm. extremely important for everybody, not just men, to question all these things in our society that we take for granted. That's just everywhere. Because the biggest thing I hear from men and women is that, well, that's just the way it is. Well, uh, no, it doesn't have to be that it way. It doesn't have to be that way. Perfect words to end on. Thank <laughs> you so much, Greg. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't. That could be a whole new slogan there. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming and sharing all of this information. We'll put some of the important information like contact numbers and so on in the mm -hmm. website or, or, and the website mm -hmm. in the credits of the program. But thank you so much for coming and sharing. You've certainly educated us on a lot of things we didn't know, things I didn't know. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It was nice. And thank you for watching. Please join me again for future episodes of Today's Tidings.